Hello everyone, kia ora. Kia ora to those of you joining us in New Zealand, many of you in New Zealand. Thank you so much for joining us. Today we welcome you and offer you this opportunity to direct your questions to our distinguished experts in the field of early childhood education and child development, both mothers and might I add, my dear and generous friends. You can write your, your questions in the Q&A section and we will try to get to as many as possible. As a surprise to you, we will award a full scholarship to attend the seminars on July 1st and 2nd, California time, with Ana Tardos and her team at the Pickler House. The drawing will be at the end of our session. Thank you, Sari. So as a gift to you now, I introduce our panelists who are here to share their amazing knowledge, wisdom, and love. First, I introduce Professor Tamar Jacobson. Tamar is an early childhood development and education consultant for early childhood programs, organizations, and families. She was born in Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, and traveled to Israel, where she became a preschool teacher with the Israeli Ministry of Education. Tamar completed a doctorate in early childhood education at the University at Buffalo, UB. As director of the University at Buffalo Child Care Center, she created a training site for early childhood students from area colleges, including UP. Tamar is a retired professor from Ryder University, New Jersey, and served as chair of the Department of Teacher Education for seven years. Dr. Jacobson serves on the consultant editors panel for NAEYC. She was recipient of the 2003 Director of the Year Award, the 2003 Outstanding Early Childhood Teacher Educator Award, and is a former fellow in the Child Trauma Academy. Tamar presents at national and international conferences, which is precisely how we met. She is author of Confronting Our Discomfort, Clearing the Way for Anti-Bias. Also of Don't Get Upset, Help Young Children Manage Their Feelings by Understanding Your Own. And Everyone Needs Attention, Helping Young Children Thrive. And might I add, Tamar has two precious kitties that steal my heart every time I see them on her Facebook. <laughs> so now I introduce Master Tony Christie, who is the director of the Child Space Early Childhood Institute in Wellington, New Zealand. She is passionate about early childhood education, leadership, environments, infants, teamwork, communication, and advocacy for children, families, and early childhood educators. Tony holds a master's degree in education with merit from Victoria University in Wellington. Tony enjoys her many roles in life as wife, mother, author, keynote speaker, marriage celebrant, justice of the peace, editor, musician, artist, and mentor. She loves to sing, dance, and play with her family friends and colleagues every day. And here she is playing with us today. Last time the three of us were together was in 2017 in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where the three of us were invited as keynote speakers. Ooh, here's a photo of Tony gifting her book to us. Here she is. How lovely. She gave us a copy of her book. So now here we are together again, what joy. So now let's please welcome Professor Tamar 
Jacobson. Welcome, dear Tamar. Thank you so much for that in introduction. Um, I appreciated that very much. You know, um, the other day, I, I think I saw it on Facebook, Elsa, you um, put up a little piece about how our hands are the first um, touches that infants feel and how important our hands are and how we use our hands. And it made me think about my mother's hands. Um, it, it was very moving for me to see that. I was looking all over if it was Facebook or somewhere where I had seen that you had posted that. And I, I couldn't find it because I wanted to read it out loud. Um, but what it did was make me think about my mother's hands and I loved her hands very much. Um, and hands in general became very important to me all my life. In fact, I sort of judge people by their hands because um, I think that's the first relationship that we have is through touch. The way we are caressed and held and comforted when we're, when we're infants. Um, and I've struggled all my life with my relationship with my mother. And this thinking about her hands made me feel so much kinder towards her, um, sort of forgiving. Uh, in fact, I, I have a little anecdote about that. Um, she was going to have my younger brother and I was uh, eight and uh, she was looking for a place for me to stay when she went to the hospital. And she had a friend, her name was Pat. And Pat had very similar kinds of hands to my mother. So I chose her to go and stay with because I trusted her from, from hands. So I thought that was such an important piece. Um, it also made me realize how much I connect the way that I relate to people with my childhood, with, with how I became me. Um, and I remember as a, as a preschool teacher in Israel, I would always start the first day with the parents sitting in a circle time with the children. Um, I used to have children ages two through five, mixed age in my classroom. And I would tell them, I would start off by saying, I have these hands and these hands are for comforting you because you're allowed to cry here if you miss your, your family. Um, and the parents would just love that. They would wait for me to say that and the children would feel safer about it. So. I, I really made that connection when I saw that that piece that you had put up somewhere on Facebook, either through the Pickler Institute or through or through your own. Um, and I'd like to just throw out to everybody who's listening, you know, what do you think? You don't have to answer that now, but just to, as a thing to think about about hands. Um, you know, um, the, the the men that I fell in love with, it was important to me what their hands looked like and how they, they uh, used them, actually. So uh, th just something to, to, to start off with, which leads me into the most important thing that I think in our work with ch young children is our relationships that we create with them. More, I mean, I know I want them to read and I want them to write and I want them to succeed, but I, I feel that they can't do any of that unless they feel really secure in their relationships with the adults who, who care for and educate them. Um, and in order to do that, I focus on our work with ourselves as teachers, or as educators, or as human beings working with other people, making connections between how we were brought up, how things affected us, and how we feel about things. That's why I was making the connection with hands um, in, in, in that one. Relationships, we all need them connection. We all need it. And uh, in my book, Everyone Needs Attention, we all need attention. I like to think of attention as we all need relationship, and then maybe we can feel better about children needing our attention, if we think of it in terms of relationship. And then I'll go one step further, and please stop me if I'm going over too long, Elsa, because you probably all know that I love to talk um, especially on this topic. Um, lately, I've been thinking about self-compassion because I, I think compassion is such an, a, a critical, um, it's, it's so critical for us in our work with children and families. Um, 
It's not just kindness. It's really understanding in an empathetic way with empathy, um, how a person has experienced life and what they feel, putting ourselves in their shoes. But I think it must be hard to be compassionate with others if we aren't compassionate with ourselves. You know, I, I, you know, I, I was looking at the Weight Watchers website um, a, a few weeks ago, just out of interest, because they talk a lot about stopping people from saying bad things about themselves in terms of how they look and how they feel about their, their weight and so forth. And I know that I have that, you know, I have it sometimes that I could look in the mirror and I think, oh God, you look so old, you look so ugly. And then I think I'd never say that to a friend of mine. How do I say that to me? That makes me think about how can I ask people to be compassionate with children if they don't have a, a feeling of compassion for themselves? Because if I'm asking educators to work on themselves, on how we got our our emotional life script, how we develop that as young children and how that affects how we work with others or relate with others. I think we need a lot of self-compassion as we do this very important work. Um, in fact, I think if we're working with children and families, we have an obligation to understand ourselves. It's not, it's not like working in a bank or a grocery store. We're working with, with fragile, emotional uh, little souls. And we don't want to unintentionally harm them or hurt them. And a lot of stuff we do is so unconscious because we've learned it as young children. So I think that making that connection, being compassionate with ourselves as we do the, the personal work as it accompanies us as we work with children and families. That is critical. I think I might have talked too long. No? Do you want more? <laughs> I think maybe we hear from Tony and then we see some questions and I can go on a bit further. Is that good? You want mm -hmm. me to continue? <laughs> I thank you so much. Thank you, Tamar, Professor Jacobson. What a lovely and important uh, presentation. Short, but powerful. We all learned so much from you. And you spoke so beautifully of our hands, your mother's hands and the touch, how we are caressed and held as infants. And then speaking about our relationship with infants and young children so they can feel secure. And then you added the topic of self-compassion understanding ourselves to understand young children, how important it is to address this topic. Thank you so much, Dr. Jacobson. I truly appreciate it. I just want to add one thing. <laughs> um, you know, I, I always thought that I had difficulty with my mother and touch because I felt like she, she, she wasn't very touchy feely. She was very British. Um, and yet I loved her hands. So as an infant, I think she must have touched me a lot and very gently and kindly, which I had never thought about before. So I want to thank you, Elsa, for what you put up one day on Facebook somewhere. I can't find it anymore, but anyway, sorry, that's it. It's on YouTube. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> But how lovely, because you have that first connection with your mom and probably that paved the way to where you are now in your life, serving young children and ser serving adults and ser serving parents and caregivers. So I think your mother's touch probably really made a strong impact in your life. And this is where you are now. So thank you, Dr. Jacobson, and thank you to your mother uh -huh. for inspiring you to be on this journey. So before we go to your questions, I know you have some questions now for Dr. Jacobson. Uh, it is my great privilege to welcome Master Tony Christie. So take it away, Tony. <laughs> Kia ora koupapa bano o Aotearoa and also thank you for having me, uh, Elsa. And uh, lovely to hear from you, Tamar. Uh, I, maybe people don't know, but uh, some years ago, right when the pandemic began, Tamar was scheduled to come to New Zealand and uh, offer the opening keynote at our 
our conference about well-being because I heard Tamar speak at this Tulsa event that Elsa discussed. And I found that the work that she does, thinking about teachers, thinking about their subconscious and how they were held, how they were uh, treated, all that what you call emotional life script is just the most vital part, I think, of every educator's journey. I feel as though we can't do everything we want to do for children until we've really looked at ourselves. And when we can be the very best person we can, then we can offer what is right and what is just for children. Um, so yes, and I reiterate Tamar's comments about relationships. I think, you know, I, I thought about it the other day and I thought you could have a perfectly pleasant life without knowing anything about maths. But you couldn't enjoy your life without understanding relationships. And that's why I think our work in early childhood is absolutely vital because what we are working with is relationships and, and to learn relationships, to learn to be in relationship, well, that's gonna set you up for a life, for a life that's enjoyable, that's enriching. Uh, and, and as I say, all these other things that I think maybe society thinks, oh, we want them to read and write and we want them to do all these, you know, science and this and that. And you could, you know, any one of those things, you could just have no interest in at all and you would still have a rich, fulfilling life as long as you had relationship and the ability to form relationship. So that's kind of where my work uh, takes me. And um, my, my research has been all around work with very young infants in early childhood services and I want to acknowledge all the people who do work with young children in early childhood because I think that that work is is really complex it's really demanding and it is also incredibly rewarding so meaningful and so very important for our future generations and for the sustainability of our our whole ways of being our planet our life I think often about things like this pandemic have brought things into sharp perspective for people about how very important a good life is and actually how very simple living a good life can be uh, when we take care of ourselves and those around us um, I look at the, you know, the state of the world and see, I guess, what things like, like, um, like greed uh, have done to the world. I think there's only so much we need. And really, if we as early childhood educators could focus for young children on their ability to empathize, their ability for connection for relationship for compassion then we're building a better world already because when we have those things they become our values they become our focus and they become what's important in our world so um you know I want to say thank you again Elsa and Tamar it's a real pleasure to be on this board with you even though I can't be in the same room with you and hug you we had a really amazing time in Tulsa there's a Woody Guthrie museum there that we went and visited together and we sang old folk songs <laughs> which really made us bond um, and I just feel really strongly that your work Tamar uh, is something that has influenced my work as well so I, I thank you for that uh, and I guess, you know, while I'm on the subject of talking about influences, and for those of you who do, you know, want to look more into things, then uh, Pickler obviously is a huge influence for all of us. The work of Emmy Pickler, her approach is uh, the research she um, conducted and the ideas that she has been able to, I guess, you know, we've seen these go all over the world and in different ways, we've all been able to adapt her respectful ideas into our own contexts. Um, and I say adapt because there's a big difference between adoption and adaptation. And I, I kind of, it's a, probably a good point now to mention that, you know, we, we don't, we could, it's, it, you know, Pickler's approach came from a, an orphanage in Hungary. We can't just take that and just completely transplant that into an early childhood service in Aotearoa, New Zealand. 
because there will be different outcomes. And one of the most obvious differences in those two circumstances is that our children have parents and families. And, um, you know, so there are real differences in the ways that they can be done. So I guess my point there is that, uh, you know, I, I've been into early childhood services where they're very, very uh, keen to tell me that they're doing PICLA and, you know, there might be a, a young baby on the floor who's crying and they're saying, oh, well, you know, we're doing PICLA. So they're getting free movement and self-soothing and we're doing PICLA. And I think, gosh, you missed the point. PICLA was all about respect and all about relationships. And those things are being missed if you're leaving an infant to to be upset you know they're communicating cues and you need to be sensitive to those cues so Pickler is another uh, another person who's really influenced my work and I want to mention is Stuart Shanker and the work that he has done at the Merit Center around self-regulation I've, um, I've been really influenced by that I think his his method of self-reg is one that is uh easy to follow and when you understand it it becomes a real way of being so it's become part of my life I'm more inclined to be patient and kind with myself for understanding uh, the steps of self-reg I'm more likely to reframe uh, my behaviors other people's behaviors that that kind of thing and if people are interested he does run a, a I think it's about a 12-week course that's specific to early childhood educators and that's an online um, kind of training there's someone else who's special who I know is watching because she told me she was and that's Karen Stevens and Karen is from Illinois and Karen is my dear dear friend I call her my American mama because like you Tamar I didn't have a um I, you know I struggled with my relationship with my mother um and Karen was a fabulous adoptive one <laughs> And she's watching. She said, I hope I don't cry hearing your voice again, because usually by this time in the year, I might have actually seen her and hugged her myself as well. Um, yeah. So what else can I tell you? I, I guess one thing I wanted to touch on today was the danger of determinism. Um, and this is, again, coming from my work with um, Stuart Shanker, is this idea that every child has absolutely limitless potential. And when we decide, and this, you know, I need to let you know, this is deeply, deeply subconscious. So we're not even aware of it. But when we put a label on that child, when that child comes to us and we say, oh, they'll be behaving like that because da, 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 da. And development has trained us to do this. You know, knowing a lot about early childhood development means that we're more likely to say, oh, they had a difficult start to life. So that's why this. Uh, but at this very deeply subconscious level, we are determining children's potential and it's dangerous and it's something we need to challenge and we, and we really need to accept, you know, compassionately about ourselves is that it's so deeply subconscious that we need to address it and recognize it when we think it. And when, if we're ever in a position of saying, well, you know, this child's obviously going to struggle with this because look at his parents or something like that. I know that sounds terrible, but an obvious example, every child, every child has limitless potential when we see them that way. I'm going to, I think I've had it just as long as Tamara, so I'm just going to let that open and maybe we can have some banter here. Unmute yourself. I, I, I wanted to mention how we had so much fun at the Woody Guthrie Museum, um, but I also wanted to say something about self-regulation um, because it is terribly important, of course. I have no doubt about that, but I also find, maybe not in New Zealand, <laughs> but um, I find in America that it's very often used in a punitive way. Um, it, it's, there's not really a kind of guidance to help children understand how to self-regulate. They sort of put, an, put aside to deal with it, whatever it is that they're dealing with, um, and nobody sort of works with them. So I think it's a very fraught topic. And in my book, um, Everyone Needs Attention, I have a whole chapter on that because I think it's a really, I think it's very important that children learn to self-regulate, but with a lot of love and guidance and not too much punishment. 
There's a lot of absolutely. Yeah. I absolutely agree with that, Tamar. And I think that the problem stems from the differing uh, definitions of self-regulation uh, and I you know self-regulation does not mean self-control it's not you know this 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 distinction of your know, self-control often implies punitive measures or you know you're either going to reward or punish the tip of the iceberg kind of behaviors self-regulation or self-reg as uh, Stuart Shanker has said part of it is actually looking at the child, reframing their behavior. So we say, why this child? Why now? Why are they behaving this way? But then looking deeper and saying, across the five uh, domains of development, you know, uh, physical, social, uh, emotional, uh, pro-social, all these different, uh, and cognitive, what could be causing the child stress? And when we look closely, we can usually find that. Uh, and then we work to reduce the stress for the child and then we work to you know then we can reflect on that we can respond but I never think about self-regulation in isolation especially with our very young children yeah they are often not self-regulating and neither should we expect them to be self-regulating right. cert certainly not all the time I think of self-regulation as being co-regulation because for a young infant that is all there is, uh, you know, if, if, I'm, if, if I have a baby in my arms and the baby becomes alarmed, if I become alarmed, then we're both in stress. If I can meet their stress with my calm, then I can work to soothe those alarms in the child. And so that self-regulation is all about compassion and soothing Yes. Until we can learn how to do that for ourselves. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to add that. Yeah, definitely. I agree. And by the way, at that museum, I just fell in love with you and your husband. Just <laughs> I know that's not the topic, but... <laughs> Uh, I, well, I'm still deeply, deeply in love with my husband. Yes, um, I love him more every day. Robin is a very special man. And I'm really lucky because I get to work with him. He designs and builds children's playgrounds and environments. And I get to ask him to do impossible things with um, some of the spaces that we have at Child Space in New Zealand. Uh, and yeah, he'll, he'll, you know, patiently, diligently keep going and try these wacky things I pushed it in but in our wedding vows we, he, he promised to always listen to my crazy ideas so yeah, yeah he stuck with it <laughs> and it's so funny that you mention your husband now because I met you Tony at my house in Acapulco Mexico in 2003 and Tony and Robin Tony and Robin so I thought Tony was the man <laughs> and Robin was the girl <laughs> Tony is the girl and Robin is the man. So it's, I just love you guys so much. It's such a beautiful relationship and I'm so happy to be a part of your tribe. <laughs> Elsa, in, in some of my, you know, when I do PowerPoint presentations, I have a slide um, where, where Anna Tardos says, it's, it's not just about technique, but how I am with myself. Um, and I, I think that that's really important. Um, it's not just about how you do the diapers or how you're holding the baby, but it's how you feel with yourself. And because that's what you're going to pour into the, into your, the children that you're caring for. Um, I've learned very much from Anna Tardos and, and you and Pickler Institute over the years, even though I only met you very recently. <laughs> I, do, I couldn't agree more about the well-being of teachers. I think it's a, I think it's becoming more and more of an issue. Sorry, I have these, just missed that something coming up. Um, more and more of an issue, and I and I, you know, I sense that this is, you know, this is difficult work. But I think we need to really focus on the importance of it, the rewards of it, the the, the meaningful. You know, one of the things about having a good life and living a good life and enjoying your life is that you have meaningful, purposeful work. And that's exactly what early childhood is. And I think, you know, rather than focus on the, oh, we haven't got enough teachers today or whatever it is, you know, if we focus on the joy and the love of our work, then that 
that shines, you know, right back out of us. So it's this matter of living in gratitude is what I would, would mm-hmm. recommend. And what I would say is that if we consciously aware of and count the things for which we're grateful rather than focusing on the what's difficult or what's not working or what we don't have or who doesn't love us, gosh, it shines out of people. And when, like you said, Tamar, compassion first we have to have it for ourselves so people who do live in gratitude find it so much easier to identify the gifts and talents of other people when we're looking to the negative or we're living in that sort of pessimist part of our mind then we tend to see negativity and we tend to see things that aren't working or aren't right and I yeah I would just encourage people I'm just looking through my book because there's something I wanted to read to you about well-being teacher well-being here it is So we provide a model of well-being. Mentally healthy teachers bring with them positive passion and energy for their work with young children. This provides a model for children and parents that being in the company of children and learning with and alongside them is enjoyable and energizing. When teachers are emotionally unhappy, they will be unable to provide the model required for children to successfully co-regulate. And in our own uh, curriculum, Te Whāriki, in the, our New Zealand curriculum, it says kaiako, which is our Māori word for teaching and learning. Uh, so kaiako, meaning teachers, are role models for practices that support their own health and well-being and that of others. And I think those things are so important. If you're not well, you're never going to be able to offer children what they need from you. Hmm. Thank you so much. I go back to what Tamar said first. Uh, how am I with myself? So how important is that? Thank you. Anna, Anna Tardosh said that. Oh, Anna Tardosh is my <laughs> sister. You know, it's Elsa and Anna. If you've seen the movie Frozen, <laughs> Anna and Anna are sisters. So Anna and I write to each other like, would love your sister, Anna. Would love your sister, Elsa. She's my sister. Thank you so much for sharing that with me. I didn't know. I appreciate it. So everyone take into account, how am I with myself? Thank you, Tamar. And, and, and to take into account all those people that have um, guided us through this this um, journey of working with ch- young children you know I, I couldn't possibly have done this work without the guidance of, of like Lillian Katz or the Pickler Institute or Tony when I, you know I loved your presentation in Tulsa it was it, it was like oh you know we're speaking the exact same language but the, I think that that's really important how we've collaborated all and, and received this help from people along the way um, that's the gratitude piece that I'm, I'm, I'm referring to there, Tony. You know, I had a little piece to re- read from my book too, but it was it was more like a conclusion. So I'll, I'll read it when we're concluding because it's sure. the conclusion in my book about that, about this topic. Yeah. So if, if I may, at, towards the end, Elsa, then I might read that. It's just a short paragraph. I'm going to pick back up on relationships uh, and just say, you know, I've just written a note here that says teamwork, because once we're living in gratitude, once we're mentally healthy and prepared and we see this work as meaningful, then what we next have to recognize is that if the relationship is everything we are about, we need to be modeling that. So, you know, one of the things I think was so very successful about child space and it's, um, you know, from conception was that it was Robin and myself you know, a husband and wife team working out of their own home with young children. We were, de- you know, we're deeply in love. Uh, we had relationship. So every child that came in was coming into our relationship and we were welcoming them in, into our relationship. Now, I have seen early childhood services where relationships aren't working and it has such a deep effect on the children who are there. And you may even say, oh, but we're professional and we just keep our, you know, what our difference is. It's not like that. For children, it's a very subconscious, you can download everything about the environment just like that. And you can know how people care, uh, what they care about, 
<laughs> and yes, yeah, so that, that that relationship thing is just so important that we get it right throughout the service. And that means to, you know, if we're going to have a relationship based curriculum, then it's every parent, every family, every child, every teacher, everyone is in relationship, not just some. Yep, I'm in, I'm in agreement. <laughs> I'm in agreement. Actually, I do have a quote from Bruce Perry, too. Can I read you that quote? Yes, please. And tell us about the book, the book that he wrote with Oprah, because I know you've read it, and I'm, I think that the New Zealand audience would be very interested yes, in this. Well. I, I highly recommend it, this book by Oprah and Bruce Perry. It's called What Happened to You? Um, so that we don't say to children, what's the matter with you, but what happened to you? And it's about um, brain development and trauma and neglect. Um, and it's just about relationships and so forth. In fact, I got that expression relationship from Bruce Perry. I had brought him to Philadelphia to do a keynote. And there were about a, a thousand people in the room and he spoke for three hours. And at the end, a, a student ran in or one of the somebody she seemed like a young student she ran in and she said you know I missed this and I was supposed to attend it and I've got to tell my director that I that I came to it so could you just tell me briefly what you talked about and I thought this is ridiculous he can't talk now after three hours I had to get him to the airport and um, <laughs> I said well you know I don't think he's going to be able to do that for you right now um, and he just tapped my arm and he said, just tell her it's relationships, relationships, relationships. And I'll never forget how he said that. In fact, one of the chapters in my book is, is that title from him. Um, he, he's, he's very, very, he, he finds that to be very, very important. Um, and so they discuss, um, Oprah discusses her life or she discusses um, different people she's interviewed and things that they've gone through in their childhoods and then he talks about the brain development side of it and they have this discussion in the book it's very very easy to read and it's so important for everybody for parents for people who work with children for social workers for psychologists it's a, it's a really well written book i highly highly recommend it he says the more healthy relationships a child has the more likely she will be able to recover from trauma and thrive. Relationships are the agents of change and the most powerful therapy is human love. And that's a brain development guy saying that, um, human love. Um, and of course, love is also a complicated emotion, isn't it? I mean, because some people beat their children out of love. So what does that mean? So we have to be, you know, I think we have to be aware that emotions are very complex. It's not just love and, and, and uh, joy and all that. It's, everything has a different meaning for every person. Um, so, Bruce yeah, Perry. So comes. true. <laughs> but I do recommend the book. Thank you. Thank you so much. Human love. Hmm. And how I am with myself. How important, Tamar. Absolutely. Tamar and Tony, a collaborative effort. And I want to thank you so much, dear Tony. How important is the theme of relationships and limitless potential that you spoke about? And thank you so much for your presentation and our goal, our collective goal to create a better world. <clears throat> Congratulations on your new book, Tony. Can you tell us where we can purchase it? Oh, Sydney, thank you. Tamar, how can we find your books? Please let us know. Well, this is my new book. It's called Respect and Relationships. And uh, I wrote a book 10 years ago called Respect, all about working with young infants. And actually, our lockdown here in New Zealand gave me the space to revisit that book. Uh, we've been doing a lot more research uh, more recently. So... I've reviewed and updated the research in there, but also added two new chapters. And one is on continuity, which I'd love to touch on a little bit um, for this audience. 
uh, continuity because that's the new research we've been doing and the other chapter is on the neuroscience of relationships so really looking at all of that self-regulation but also just thinking about the brain and how how important how very important connections and relationships are which is the if we uh, analyze this webinar we'd find the word relationship coming up time and time again but this is a practitioner's guide to secure connections in early childhood uh, and um, it's, it's, you know, it's, I mean, it's been a, a, a really neat to be able to revisit it and really fun to look at it. The chapter on continuity is just addressing some research we've been doing at Child Space recently about once we've established that the relationship is the most important thing for a child, why not ensure that that relationship stays intact, stable? throughout their time in the early childhood service. So we've been looking, we'd always been looking at trying to keep a similar, you know, key caregiving kind of system. So primary caregiving as uh, Pickler would have said, or um, key kayak, or as we say in New Zealand, or key teaching system, whereby a uh, small group of children have a small group of adults. And those are the ones, you know, they all develop secure relationships. But we're going further than that and saying, if we can start with home visits, and go right through to primary school visits and we can keep this cohort of children and teachers together then these relationships deepen and connect and so there's a lot of information in my book around how we've done that and we've been practicing in these ways for the last kind of five to seven years at one of our child space centers and we've had the opportunity to research that uh, through a government uh, grant here in New Zealand for the last oh was kind of about 18 months it got disturbed by the pandemic but it's uh, the research is complete and part of the dissemination is the chapter in the book um, around that so I know that was a really long answer to your question but you can get my book at child space uh, so just go online to childspace.nz and you can find uh, our shop there that you can get your yeah, you can yes. get a copy if you'd like. I also have I have all uh, some other publications. So I have one about rituals, looking at making all the um, routine times more of a ritual experience for children, so that we are really engaged with our head, with our heart, with our hands. And I've also written about leadership and uh, well-being for teachers as well. Lovely, Tony. I think uh, Thanks, I answered our questions. So we have to go to childspace.nz. Yes, um, that's it. Work? Just childspace.nz. NZ. Okay. NZ yeah. in the US, NZ yeah. in the other countries. And what about uh, Dr. Jacobson? How can we find your books? How can our participants have access to your books? Oops, I have to unmute you, Professor. Oops, I don't know what I did. Professor, I'm sorry, I have you on mute. Please unmute yourself again. Sorry. Okay, here I am. <laughs> so my I have this book and it's fabulous. <laughs> Everyone needs attention. <laughs> of course, because we had a whole lot of them for the conference. So I still have some. I still have some at, uh, at our shop at the Institute too. If anybody wants a copy, hit me up. Yeah. You, you can find them at Redleaf Press and also on Amazon. Um, but I, and I think that there's a distributor for Redleaf Press in Australia, New Zealand. I, I'm not sure what the name is. Um, I also have a website where you can find out when I'm presenting and doing things. If you just Google Tamara Jacobson, you can find that that website and and so forth. Um, yeah, so th that that's my stuff. I mean, I've got the three books, two books from from Redleaf Press. This this book, everyone needs attention, grew out of the book. Um, don't get so upset, help young children manage their feelings by understanding your own. I did a lot of um, uh, presentations on discipline and children needing attention kept coming up. So I finally said to Redleaf Press, can we just republish the book and add a chapter on it? And they said, no, we want a whole book on it. So that's how it, that's how it came about. So it's basically, if you read the two books together, you get a lot of the pieces about attention and discipline, but it's all focused on our self work in, in regards to that. How fantastic. Thank you to both of our expert uh, panelists and authors. Thank you so much. And now this is time we have 
less than 15 minutes now for your questions. We have Sari Montero, volunteer administrative attache and translator of Tickler Lotzi USA, and who is on her way of becoming a certified Tickler professional. She will be helping us to moderate your questions. So please send your questions and she will moderate any questions that you have coming in for our uh, expert panelists. And then she will do the raffle. Thank you so much, Elsa. So we have a question for Professor Jacobson and Master Tony Christy. On the subject of constantly working on our, ourselves and growing as individuals, how can school as an organization help their educators in this area? Oh boy, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, I mean, what I'd really like to do with the rest of my career is facilitate support groups for teachers um, in schools so that they can talk about these things that are that are critical in their work with children. You know, counselors have supervision. And when they're feeling different things about their, the, the, their clients, they can go to their supervisor and talk it through. Um, teachers don't have that. They have lots of trainings about you know, classroom management and, and how to teach ABC and all that kind of thing. But there is no place for them to go to work on themselves. And I think it's critical for, for teachers. I, I wish there would be enough money that schools would receive to employ me as a facilitator of these support groups, I would go everywhere to do it. And it doesn't have to be for a long time, because once you start on the journey, you can, um, you can continue even on your own, or even get together with some friends or some colleagues, I mean, and, and discuss it. The problem with that is, if you don't have a, a professional facilitator, you might just sit there venting about you know, and gossiping and stuff like that, you do kind of need some guidance about making the connections. Um, my, my dissertation was, I did a support group for teachers and it was really, really good for them. Um, so yeah, I wish schools would do that. As a director, I would help my, my um, teachers a lot in talking about their issues and how it connected. I had lots and lots of tissues in my office because people cry. When, they, when they're confronting themselves, right? When they confront their discomfort, as my first book was called. It's, it's hard work uh, facing ourselves and how we came to be us. I had to face that I was kind of unwanted. I was sort of stuck between two important husbands of my mother. I'm not gonna go in detail, but I had to face that as an adult. And it took me many years to face it and still love my mother and forgive her because understanding why that happened. But it's hard to face that feeling, right? So that's a great question. Thank you. Yes, I think it's a, sorry. I think that's a great question too. I'm, I'm happy to add that I've been thinking quite deeply about how uh, we can help you, you know, because at Child Space, we're also employers. We have four small centers there and uh, adapted residential homes. So, you know, we have a, kind of one centre just has a licence for 22 children. They're quite small services, but I've also been thinking about, because of the way early childhood has evolved, we are really, you know, we're working for working parents. So we have to offer very long hours. Uh, and then, you know, teachers doing kind of 40 hour weeks is, you know, that's a big ask for the work we're asking them to do. If you look at, uh, you know, primary and secondary school teachers, their 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 face to face time with their students is nothing like that. And, you know, and I don't know fully what the answer is because I don't believe that the profession is paid well enough for people to still still support their families if they're working less than forty hours. But I do think what we've done a lot of recently at Child Space is actually start to look at what's required and then what is best for your well-being? What do you need? And what would work best for you and your family situation? And so we've ended up with different things, job sharing or split shifts or, um, you know, some people with shorter hours and so forth. And I think that we need to be, you know, your question was how can schools help or how can, I guess, employers help? And I think 
the answer is to be a little bit more flexible and open to trying new things or, or, or doing things in ways that might offer more support uh, to the, for the mental health and well-being of the teachers. And, I, you know, we're only at the precipice of this work and I believe we need to do a lot more. Thank you, Tony. And thank you, Professor Jacobson. We have another question. How can you not label or make assumptions or judge when you are trying to understand where a child is coming from when he is in a stress or conflict? Hope this question makes sense. The question does make sense. And I know it's in reference to what I was discussing. I think you can't. I think you need to be aware of it is what I'm trying to suggest. And, you know, development teaches us to look for those reasons like what you know if we really want to understand the child then actually the whole child brings with them all of this background that we that we kind of need to understand but judging it is different again and and whether we're conscious of that or not is important as well because I guess what we need to what we need to uh, ask ourselves is is this equitable practice? You know, would I do would I do this for someone else? You know, is my treatment fair? Is it kind? Is it compassionate? Is there? Uh, uh, am I doing this just because of what I understand about the child? And and is that determining their potential? So I don't even know if that answers the question, but I really get the question and I totally understand it. I think I'm, what I'm asking people to be is just more aware that we all have these subconscious determinist thoughts. They're not anything we can fix, but we can get better at it if we're more aware of them. And, and we can make connection with ourselves about it. For example, if, if we had our face slapped, because we answered back our parents, right? And it could have been just asking a question, like, why, why do I have to do that? And then we got slapped for that. It's gonna be very hard for us when we feel like a child is answering us back. So we may, might label them as being very rude. And, you know, we've got to punish them for that because that's what happened to us. Whereas if we start to get in touch with ourselves and understand that, okay, my parents did that, but I don't have to do that. Um, it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's a something that we have to accompany our work is understanding how we get to these feelings. You know, I, I used to say to, to other teachers when they send their child, children to my class after they'd been in their class, I don't want to hear about it. Don't tell me what's happened there. I'll make my own determinations in our place mm -hmm. and you know we we had children in our center who were I used to call them refugees because they were expelled from other centers at one and a half at age mm -hmm. one and a half or two now can you imagine expelling children at two and I never told the teachers that they'd been expelled I just you know accepted mm -hmm. the children and the teachers carried on doing what they always do with all the children and 90 percent or close to 100% of the time, nobody ever knew why they were expelled because we incorporated them in, in the ways that we did the work with children. And young so, children's behavior too, it changes so quickly. If you know, yeah. I remember when Robin and I started Child Space and we had, there was a child who wanted to come and we went to every, uh, the Mayor's Welfare Fund and all of these different things to ensure that this child could come for free because the child was known to the police at age three. Mm -hmm. You know, and this child came straight inside our doors punched me in the face and but every child there pulled back from that behavior they 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 let the child you know they were the ones that changed the child's behavior because I didn't have to do a thing they just kind of they all were very clear that this isn't what we do to Tony and you know so they weren't going to have a bar of that and interestingly enough you know where he had been the 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 biggest behavior was the winner, you know? So if your behavior was really unruly, then, you know, 
obviously you get the most attention kind of thing. But actually, in this case, he really just needed to be in a different environment that was showing compassion, that was showing love, and that was rewarding those behaviors, and that was suggesting that empathy is an important thing here. But, you know, what you said, Tamara, and I think one of the reasons we had such a lovely connection when we first met, too, is I believe that there are, you know, I, when I, the more I speak to early childhood teachers, I think that a lot of us came into early childhood because of traumatic early childhood events. Yep. And we have felt like you said, just because I was slapped in the face, I can do it differently. And I was always very firm about that, that what I wanted to do was offer opportunities for children that respected their rights and their competence and their abilities, because that wasn't what I was always afforded. And I think that, you know, in early childhood, we're, you know, we're lucky to get the opportunity to really make that difference. And so I often think that People come into early childhood if they've either had a dreadful upbringing or a wonderful upbringing. <laughs> and I'm still, you know, they're, they're, they're both equally righteous paths. Um, but I think one is about wanting to do better than you had. And the other thing is about wanting to emulate what you had. I, you, I, I know we probably want to answer another question, but I think on that note is I'd like to read that paragraph from the end of yeah. my book because it, it's connected to what you've just said. Is that okay also if I do that quickly? It, it, when stormy emotional rivers have thrashed around me, I have hung on for dear life to compassion and gratitude. They have always steered me through to the other side, to calmer waters of acceptance and love. As teachers, children give us work, passion and inspiration. They will love us with all their might if we pay attention to them with an open heart. If we watch them closely, we can learn about emotions, spontaneity, joy for life, curiosity, and ourselves. For we relive our own childhoods over and over again, each time redeeming our own selves through their first time discoveries and expressions of amazement. Be grateful for them, forgive them, and love them with all your might. Mm, the redeeming that's is beautiful. What I wanted to talk about. That's so beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so Do much. You we have one minute left, and I want to thank everyone for being here. We have uh, wonderful opportunities coming up uh, as part of Pickler USA. And Sadi perhaps can share what are the things that are coming up if you want to continue to learn about the Pickler pedagogy. We have this great opportunity to be with Ana Tardos on July 1st and July 2nd. And a, this is a fundraiser for the Pickler pedagogy. So all proceeds go directly to um, the Pickler house. And also starting this Friday, Saturday for New Zealand and Australia. We have a three-day introduction to the Pickler Pedagogy. Maybe uh, Sadi can share that screen with you. This is with uh, Dr. Bussey, um, Angiel Till, a former caregiver at the Pickler House who studied under Dr. Pickler. Also with us would be the neurologist, uh, Paula Gurayev, who will speak about neurodevelopment and myself. So I hope you can join us. <laughs> Uh, you can find all the details as part of pickler.org, P-I-K-L-E-R.org. Thank you, Sadi. And now, Sadi, let's go to our drawing of a full scholarship of Anna's seminar. All of your names, all 215 of you, even though not all of you are present, but all your names have been included in the drawing. So, Sadi, let's go for it. Thank you, Elsa. We have 200. 34 people registered and we will see who is going to attend so good luck to everyone so better plays mary and we have a runner-up in case this person can't or won't be able to attend, then Kat C. Hyung will be attending and taking um, the online seminar. 
I just saw a question pop up, Elsa. Uh, congratulations. Uh, but it was about the recording of the webinar. And I know a lot of people have asked me that too. I know that there will be a recording and it will be made available. So I think uh, Elsa will make that available on the Pickley USA site and we will share it on the Child's Face site. And also there was a question from Helen I saw pop up and I can't resist it. No, the book is not on our website, uh, Tamar's one, but Helen, write me an email and I will get you a copy. And I'll also um, put on my Facebook page, the recording. Yes, so we are unable to access Facebook Live because something happened with the Zoom features. So we will be, we are recording this. We will be editing it professionally and posting it on YouTube and from YouTube sharing to our page and subsequently to um, Tony's and Tamar's pages. And I wanna say congratulations to the winners. And I wanna say thank you for everyone that was here with us today. And I really wanna wish you a rest of, a beautiful rest of your week. And really thank you infinitely Tamar and Tony for your support, for your time, your love and for having had shared your wisdom with all of us. I am so, 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 so grateful. Thank you for the opportunity, Elsa. Yes, thanks, Elsa. And thanks for choosing Tamar to have with me. I love <laughs> her. <laughs> oh, we are going to are we going to meet again, Tamar? Uh, you know, obviously we have to get past the pandemic first, but then we're back on. Definitely. <laughs> okay. I found the perfect team. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Sari. Thank you so much, Sadi, and thank you, everyone. Good night, and hope to see you very soon. And until next time, thank bye you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.